Today, we have a proposal with a new faculty at UBC Computer Science, uh, working on HCI, is a member of the FD and Mark Research Group. Uh, he recently arrived uh, at January this year, right? Mm -hmm. um, very fresh. <laughs> <laughs> um, he graduated at Charlie Mellon for his PhD, uh, worked with uh, Chris Harrison and Matt uh, Hudson. Um, he's also involved in Quixo, which is a really cool startup company, uh, and he's involved in many interesting machine learning based gesture techniques for the bus uh, free bus. Uh, he's working on uh, computer science and mathematics based HCA approach, really, really technical. For developing phone body sensors um, uh, and also computer vision techniques for AR and VR interaction uh, techniques. And today we're going to post this talk which awarded a uh, ACMC High Outstanding Dissertation. Really So I'm going to ask the microphone to do Thank you. Thank you very much, Don Wolf. Yeah, it's uh, you know, just starting out, I guess, but uh, this is going to be largely my thesis work, um, just talking about how we can enable computational interaction with everyday surfaces, such as the uh, tables, the walls, the furniture, and so on. Uh, so just as a quick introduction, as we all know, computer technology used to be limited just to just the handful of people who could reasonably afford it. But as computers grew smaller, faster, and cheaper, people began to predict that someday computers would become ubiquitous meaning that everyone could have access, seamless access to computing technology whenever and wherever they wanted. Now, Mark Weiser, the father of so-called ubiquitous computing, um, said that the highest ideal is to make a computer so embedded, so fitting, and so natural that we use it without even thinking about it. The most profound technologies are those that weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. This is a pretty profound statement. And Arguably, today, it seems that we've achieved that ubiquitous computing vision. Mobile computing is king now. Billions of people own smartphones, which are highly sophisticated computers jammed into our pockets. And that means that, of course, smartphones have just disappeared into our lives, right? No, of course not. If you actually want to interact with the digital world, you have to do it through this kind of terminal. And digital content is therefore fully separated from the physical world. This isn't quite the vision of ubiquitous computing that was originally promulgated. Every interaction with that tiny screen demands the full user attention. And rather than computing being seamless and everywhere, our current access to computing is quite limited to small black mirrors. And that's actually where that term comes from. Out of 20 years after Mark Weiser proposed his harmonious ubiquitous computing vision, Charlie Brooker created the Sophie TV series named after her own black mirrors the cold, shiny screens of TVs, monitors, and smartphones. So today, I'm going to talk about one of the research threads that I've, that I've pulled on for the past seven years, about how we can expand computing out of the small track interfaces of today and out onto the world around us, onto our everyday services, walls, and tables. And this is what I call on-world computing, bringing interaction out onto natural everyday services and embedding computational capabilities directly into the real world. Now, there's a couple ways you could do this. One way is you could just expand interaction out onto our world by replacing our world with computers. Simply put, we could replace tables with big touch screens, walls with giant TVs, countertops with tablets, and so on until everything is computers. But maybe the obvious downside here is the cost, right? Although computers might be cheap nowadays, they're not going to be as cheap as drywall and wood anytime soon. And it's really difficult to upgrade. Imagine you have to tell someone, OK, you have to buy a wall 2.0 next year. It's the must-have upgrade. <coughs> and it ultimately still limits you to surfaces that are suitably augmented. So what's the alternative? Instead of modifying the environment to, to accommodate computing, what we should want to do is uh, modify computing to accommodate our environments. We want our walls to still be walls, and our furniture to still be regular furniture, but we just want everything to get a little more interactive. And we actually have a technology that can enhance environments at a distance. It's the light bulb. So when I talk today, I'll, I'll show you the research that sort of took the basic one pixel light bulb and moves it all the way into a full interactive interface projector, something that will be capable of putting touch interfaces on any surface in the environment. 
This actually raises a whole bunch of challenges. So instead of nice, neat grids of pixels that are managed by code, the real world is a complex, ever-changing space that's managed by humans. And so consequently, the system is going to have to adapt to accommodate that kind of complexity. So there are four fundamental problems to address here. First, you want to be able to receive input from users to operate those interfaces. Ideally, you want to do this without adding <coughs> any extra sensors on surfaces and without, and without having users carry around a special device. You want them to be able to walk up and just use the interface. Secondly, you want to be able to display graphical feedback on the environment to close that input-output feedback loop. Every input surface should also function as an output surface. That way, we can enable efficient direct input. And third, users have to have some set of interactions that they can perform with that system to actually make use of it. The more interactions they can perform, the better, right? Give them the flexibility to control their world and their, their digital interfaces the way they want. And finally, the system needs to be able to respond to the environment, to changes in, in, in its environment. The changes in the environment should be reflected in the system state. That way, there's a more seamless experience between the two. So these are the challenges I'm going to address through the various projects in my talk. And let me just show you a first early system that demonstrates the kind of on-world interfaces that we're looking for. This was WorldKit, done back in 2013. My first foray into on-world interaction. Now this is a vehicle that we used, that I used throughout my thesis to actually explore the potential applications and the pain points of on-world interactions. So WorldKit is a software toolkit for the world. Basically what it allows us to do is write applications that live on the environment. So in this clip, I'm defining a simple status app for my office. So this is something that you know, I, could, I could put on my office door. Um, and when, <clears throat> when I close my door, it'll actually show you know, which, which uh, option I've selected. That way, people know I'm in a meeting, I'm working, or you know, just knock on my door to, let, you know, to, uh, to, know, to let me know that you're coming. And the WorldKit application programmer, that's me in this case, has defined the controls that, go, that, that the application actually requires. And then the user chooses where each control goes. In this way, the user will customize the application for their particular space and their particular needs. WorldKit itself is pretty simple. It consists of a, a paired depth camera for input sensing and a projector for output. These are fastened together and calibrated into a single unit that's pointed at whatever surface you want to augment. Now, uh, depth cameras, uh, if you haven't used them before, they're basically, depth, they're basically cameras that capture depth images 30 times a second. So here's an example frame from a depth camera. Each pixel, instead of representing a color like a traditional camera, represents the distance to the nearest object. And at startup time, what the system does, what WorldKit does, is it will collect a few seconds of depth imagery and compute per pixel statistics to establish a statistical background that captures the noise distribution at every pixel. And so now, by comparing in incoming depth data to that background statistical model, we can detect user activity. So here, the pixels are colored <coughs> according to the differences from the background. Pixels that are close to the background are colored green. That's <coughs> pixels that haven't changed from the background model. Uh, pixels that are too far to the, you know, in the foreground are colored dark green. That means that they're, they're not contacting the surface. And then pixels in that sort of Goldilocks zone that are close to the surface but still far enough away that they're distinct from the background model are colored, are colored blue. That's what end up being our touch points. So those are what we use to detect when users are contacting the surface. And touch detection is used to both detect user painting gestures and for sensing touch on interactive elements. So the second issue that we were talking about earlier is output. Unlike normal projection, the WorldKit projector is not necessarily going to be uh, oriented you know, like this projector, perfectly perpendicular to the surface, but rather in almost any arbitrary angle. I just said, you know, point it at a surface and go. So that means that the, uh, the, the image actually has to be warped to appear correct. So what I use is the painted region defines a plane in 3D. So you can see the x, y, z axes um, shown there. And the surface normal is defined by the plane. <clears throat> and we then compute a projection matrix. The system com computes a projection matrix that maps the plane coordinates onto the projector coordinates and vice versa. And the result is that what comes out of the projector looks like that you know, big warped image, but then what actually shows up on the, on the environment is nice and rectilinear. So what this means is that the developer doesn't have to think about the fact that their stuff's being projected on the environment. They just think about it as 
you know, I give you a 2D canvas, you draw into this canvas. The only difference is that instead of drawing in pixels, you draw in millimeters, in real world units. And then I developed a software toolkit uh, that allows you to develop WorldKit applications. So this is the software side of WorldKit. Uh, and essentially, this looks like a standard 2D GUI app. You define a button, you attach an, uh, an event listener to that button, and then you instantiate the button. Now, the one difference here is that when that instantiation happens, instead of it just showing up on the screen, the, uh, the user is actually prompted to place that element somewhere on their environment, if they haven't done that in the past. So this way, it basically makes it very easy for programmers to develop applications that look like <coughs> GUI applications, but for them to actually live on the environment and be customized to a user's world. Besides buttons, WorldKit also supports a couple of other different kinds of interactive widgets. So contact sensors is one example, um, and different kinds of sensors that can sense uh, properties of touch or properties of the environment, like brightness or color. And so this can be used uh, for a couple of different applications. So one sort of funny example uh, is, is a recipe helper. So this is actually something that was used in a real study involving Alzheimer's patients as a way for them to actually remember um, what kinds of things that they were trying to build the recipe out of. Um, the various slots will countermeasure the ingredients, and then users can actually see visually when their whole recipe is satisfied by the checklist in the top left. Uh, and here's an office application. And I turned the whiteboard here to a digital whiteboard. So, you know, contact tracking here is pretty rough. It's not, ac it's not super accurate, but it's good enough for sort of a first prototype, a first whack at the system. And that's me from a very long time ago. Um, and the, the, the other thing you'll notice is there's actually a sensor on the keyboard. So uh, there's uh, a private calendar that shows up only if I sit down and put my hands on the keyboard. So that way, my private calendar stays private when people just wander to my office and I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting at my desk. So as an I initial early exploration into on-world interfaces, WorldKit found initial solutions to a number of interesting problems, finding input, providing output, defining interactions. And it provided that first look at what an on-world system could look like. But you see, uh, for, for input, touch tracking was just one of the many sensors that were available. But as I built that, those interaction techniques and sample applications more and more, I found that it's, I was increasingly using touch and multi-touch to essentially build large touch screens on the world. And this is an interesting insight, pointing that touch might actually be sort of a, a really good way to interact with the environment. And WorldCut also demonstrated that it was possible to display coordinated rectified graphics if you had a suitable model of the environment making it possible to place the projector freely anywhere in the room and just point it at whatever surface you wanted. And finally, I found that it was possible to construct a software toolkit that made on-world programming really easy. By treating all the UI widgets, basically as 2D surfaces, the user could just determine where to put them, and the programming paradigm looked like traditional GUI programming. But on the other hand, <coughs> WorldKit isn't quite there yet, right? This isn't the end of my talk. Um, the contract tracking was decent for detecting contact or no contact, but it wasn't good for much else, right? The, you can see the positional tracking was pretty rough. And for output, WorldKit used a really big projector, which, to be honest, you wouldn't really want to put inside a home you know, uh, environment. So uh, user interaction was also really simple. It was just <coughs> painting and hand tracking. And so in my PhD thesis, I set out to basically solve each of those problems I, saw, I showed you earlier. Using WorldKit as sort of a base, but then building on top of that to do something much better. <coughs> so the first thing I tackled was input sensing. To get really accurate touch input tracking, I built a system called Direct, which stands for Depth Infrared Enhanced Contact Tracking. And what this actually enables is high precision tracking of the fingertips using only an off-the-shelf depth camera, the same kind that we use, that's similar to what we used in WorldKit. And this makes it possible to build huge world-scale touchscreens with the kind of accuracy you'd expect from a traditional electrically sensitive capacitive touchscreen. So here's, a, you know, and, and importantly, this picture shows uh, direct, which is the filled green circles, compared against every other method we could find in the literature. And so here's a quick tour of those, those other methods. Um, this very simplest method is called a single frame background subtraction. This is what happens if you, you, know, you, you take a picture of the background. Um, kind of like what we did in WorldKit, but just one frame. And then you subtract all incoming depth frames from this. And this is something that if you look at the way people implement these, the very first time they want to implement their own touch tracking with a depth camera, this is typically what they go for. Uh, because it's simple, it's really easy to implement, and it's also really crude. 
Um, you, can Im you can improve this a little bit, and there's actually a paper published on this by uh, selecting the maximum background, uh, the maximum pixel at, e at every point. This mitigates a little bit of the noise that you get in, in, these, um, in these depth images. Or you can do what I did in WorldKit, which is to take a window of frames and then average over them, produce a statistical model, and have the mean and standard deviation at every pixel. Um, and this provides yet a, a little bit more robustness. Um, and alternately, you can then look at the shape of the, of the human finger. Um, so there's this project called OmniTouch, which looks at the actual shape, um, so-called sort of sausage finding in images, to look at the, 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 the characteristic cylindrical shape of the human finger. And uh, notably, one of the things you'll notice is all of these systems, they use depth cameras, but they only use the depth channel. And depth is just not enough. And you'll see, actually, here's what happens when you try to track fingers using just depth. This is my finger placed flat on the surface on the left, and my finger placed at a very high angle on the, on the right. And in the left, you can see my fingers just blur into the background. There's no distinction between my fingers and the background. In the right, the, very, the tip of my finger isn't visible at all. It, only, it ends at the knuckle because of the very high oblique angle. But if you actually look at the infrared image, and this is something that's also provided by most depth cameras, it becomes a lot more obvious. Right? On the other hand, now the infrared image doesn't tell you how far the fingers are away, so you can't detect contact. So of course, the, the insight behind direct is if we co combine both of those techniques, then now we can get contact tracking and we can get edge tracking. We know where the finger ends. And with this simple insight, we can actually provide very, very high accuracy tra depth tracking. You can see on the bottom right, that's actually the output of the tracker without any smoothing applied whatsoever. So that's the raw output. And we can follow a line that's barely as wide as the finger. So how does that actually work? So first of all, what we do is a background model. Just like WorldKit, you know, it uses a, uh, a, a dynamic rolling window. Now, um, unlike WorldKit here, what we're doing is we're tracking the last end frames, not just the first end frames that were picked at startup. That way, um, if, the, if there are changes in the environment, the record can actually pick those up without having to restart the whole system. And then, on every input frame, we capture the, 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 in, the depth and infrared imagery. Now, this is from a Connect uh, version 2, which provides both of these input channels. Um, transform the depth, the depth by subtracting our background model, and then transform the infrared image by computing the edge map. And uh, there's a, a bunch of extra stuff here that I'm not showing you for how do we deal with uh, ga gaps and shortfalls in the edge map. But basically, we can obtain a pretty clean edge map from almost any infrared image here to segment the, the fingers away from the background. And then we combine those images together, uh, locate the hand, arms, hands, and fingertips in that combined image. Uh, shown here, so this is kind of a hierarchical model. We look for arms first because they're very distinctive, very high off the surface and cylindrical. We then look for hands, and then we dive down into the fingertips. And this hierarchical model is actually really nice for us. It rejects anything that isn't human. So we know that arms should be visible in the scene. So if we don't see, if we see things that kind of look like fingertips, but they're not connected to arms or hands, then they're probably just noise pixels. Um, and then, so obviously, you know, this is kind of a nice system in theory. How well does it work? Um, so we compared against all those methods that I found from the literature, so all four of these comparison methods. Uh, and you can see, first, there's sort of a video showing how well does this actually work when I'm just touching you know, on the surface. Um, so direct the filled green circle obviously performs a lot better. For the actual study, uh, what we did was we brought 12 participants in, um, had three different task types that I'll show you really quick. So we had a crosshair task where users tapped on a grid um, one by one, you know, tapping on these crosshairs as, as they were displayed in random order. Um, testing how many fingers the system actually saw to test false positive and negative rates. And also uh, testing how well they could actually follow a shape if they were given feedback about where the system was actually showing them. So this is testing some kind of dynamic accuracy. And um, the results, not too surprisingly, showed that uh, direct detected touches at a much higher rate than all other systems. So it actually had a, a, a lower false positive, or false negative rate, rather. Uh, and that it had significantly better positional accuracy, average touch error of around five millimeters. And this is, if you actually look at your finger, five millimeters is about the, the radius of your finger. So this is getting to the point where this is going to be comparable to real capacitive touch screens. And we're doing this from a connect that's mounted way, way high off the surface, so completely at a distance. Um, and I also found that when you're actually doing the shape tasks, the, the error actually drops down to 2.9 millimeters mean error. That's really, really good. That's, that, that is on par with capacitive touchscreens. So 
I'm able to achieve all of that, in fact, without any smoothing, without any sort of temporal tricks, without any filtering tricks. And so if you apply some filtering to this and you run the system at a higher frame rate, you can get even better results. Okay, so that's great. We more or less solved input. You know, obviously we can do more, but that's getting us, us to a, a usable practical level right away. So for output, let me just show you really quick. Now, people have gotten really excited about the HoloLens. Um, in fact, the HoloLens 2 was re released recently to great fanfare. Um, and uh, you know, one of the big issues with the HoloLens 1 and the reason why they had to release a new version was uh, because there was really only, there's very, very limited input channels, for, especially for the original, um, where you could only do this and you could do this. And that's about it, with your hands. Uh, so it, it, and, and, and neither of those have the kind of precision that you get with touch input. So what I actually uh, set up to do, and I, this is research I did actually at Microsoft Research, um, was add touch input to mixed reality, to the HoloLens. Um, and this was actually presented uh, at IEEE VR, um, so, and, and at SIGGRAPH in Vancouver recently. So now what you can actually do is you can reach out and co-opt any touch surface, or any surface, any flat surface as a touch surface. So essentially this is what the user sees. Um, there's, this checkerboard is a debug visualization that shows you the plane that the system is, is, is currently seeing. What it's actually doing is it's looking at the surface in front of you and trying to find planes that could be used for touch input. And then what the user does is they reach out and they just drag out a surface. And that's it. That's a touch in interactive surface. That's sort of the, you know, the Windows start menu, so to speak. And then they can interact with this with st standard multi-touch interactions. Now, um, touch interaction can actually make it easy to do more advanced stuff, too. We can actually build 3D content here. So the fingers are attract not only on the surface, but over them. So I can just reach out and extrude. And so very, very quickly, I can actually build a kind of a 3D schematic here um, just, by, uh, just by using uh, touch gestures and to build the blueprint, and then hand gestures to do the rest. So this is a very, very flexible system. How does it actually work? Well, I adapted Direct to work with an egocentric viewpoint. So this is one where the, the, the depth sensor is now the one built into the hull lens mounted on your head, and a dynamic moving background. So we compute the infrared edge map again, uh, which you can see on the left, and overlay it onto the depth image. Uh, and instead of Direct's rolling background like we did in, you know, for a static fixed environment, what MR Touch um, actually has to do, what this, this mixed reality touch system has to do, is it actually has to detect the background every single frame dynamically, because the user's head is never still. And this is actually, this is a bit challenging. So what it's actually doing is it's using um, RANSAC, random sample consensus, to, f to sort of, sort of uh, find the, the plane that best fits the available depth data. And then that's the blue overlay here. Um, and then uh, Direct itself will then take over and try to find you know, hierarchically the arms, the hands, the fingers. And I actually had to optimize Direct so it would run on the embedded processor that's running in the HoloLens because it had to be low latency. We couldn't ship all the depth data off to a computer and do processing later. And uh, evaluating this new version of Direct, I found it also achieved around five millimeters average error. So this is pretty good. Now, without even having a depth camera that's staying still, we can still get really high accuracy. OK, so that sort of solves one of our output problems, which is saying, OK, well, we could actually use augmented reality headsets as a way to make projection less bulky and less difficult. And then later on, I'll show you a smaller, a smaller projection system as well. But for now, we can say that's one of our threads sort of addressed. And finally, I want to uh, talk about how we can approach the problems of interaction and embeddedness, <coughs> making sure that those on-world interfaces also work well with our environment. So this is desk topography. I investigated how we can actually build on-world interfaces that live on complex desk surfaces. So if you look at the literature on digital desks, one commonality is pretty obvious. They, the, these, these future desks are really clean, clear of clutter, right? It seems like in the future, we did away with all the things that actually clutter real desks and just have digital content. Aha, you know, I can see people shaking their heads because that's not what your desk looks like. Um, you know, they're, they're rarely gonna be so clean and clear. Digital desks, uh, digital content does, does not have much space in which they can live. And people aren't likely to just immediately get rid of all this stuff just so they can live a fully digital experience. <coughs> so I set out to see how we could make digital interfaces coexist peacefully with these physical objects on your desks. 
Um, to do this, I had to figure out what people's expectations were regarding digital interfaces. So I, I used an elicitation study, which people here are probably familiar with. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the study, I brought each participant a set of paper application mockups, and I asked them to say, okay, can you arrange these interfaces on your desks as if they were digital interfaces and show me sort of how you'd expect them to behave? And then I gave them a set of hypothetical situations. I said, okay, well, if you need to put a coffee mug down here, what would happen? What, what should the interfaces do, right? Um, should they, for example, you know, in, ignore the input, that's, that, I, I, ignore that, just sit there but you know, no longer be functional? Should they quit? Should they move out of the way? And by doing this process, I listed a set of responses that taken together suggest what the user's mental model of these type of digital interfaces on desks would actually look like. And here's a sample of one user's placement of those applications. They've placed that map, uh, on a map application on the left. So I gave these sort of four applications here. The map's on the left because it's not super useful in day to day. Um, but it, you know, maybe it's something to refer to. The calendar goes more centrally in the middle. Um, and the music player goes on top of the laptop so it can augment the function keys. And finally, the number pad goes on the right because it augments the keyboard. And those latter two applications are examples of applications that are actually bound or attached to the laptop itself. So these are things that the, the user said, well, um, those should move along with the laptop. They should be part of the laptop. They're digital interfaces, but they should be part of this physical object. And that's an interesting insight. So this indicates that sometimes people want um, digital and physical interfaces to be essentially pushed together. Uh, and you can also see that those interfaces, instead of being on a rectilinear grid, they're actually in sort of a radial pattern that uh, is centered on the user. And this is pretty common, right? It's, a, you know, it's kind of an egocentric view um, that means that essentially the coordinate system we might want to think about is, is not rectilinear, but it's kind of a, a polar coordinate system, almost. And so from the elicitation, we found uh, a couple of different categories of di desired interactions. So first of all, users strongly wish to be able to execute conventional touch interactions. So this is something we definitely need to keep, right? Users are used to touch nowadays. Uh, users also want to have the power to adjust the layout of applications, move, resize, you know, rotate them. Uh, and with regards to application summoning, users have wanted some way to launch applications. So for example, to have voice commands or some sort of gesture to launch applications. Uh, and finally, users wanted to have some way to have the applications respond to changes in their environment. And now the physical cohabitation behaviors that we found were very, very variable. But these five behaviors, snapping, following, detaching, which I'll show you in a bit, uh, were commonly mentioned by participants. So, Obviously, there has to be an implementation of this too, right? The, we have to build the system to uh, real, a real system that actually implemented these behaviors. Direct will provide the touch tracking, but it doesn't support any, any uh, other behaviors. So build another software stack to support those. So this is something that actually um, uses a depth camera to read the desk surface and all the things on it. <clears throat> the first step is to read what I call the desk topography. So that's the, the height profile of all the objects in the scene. So, um, and depth cameras do this pretty easily. Um, and then we can use dis uh, discontinuities in that desk topography to figure out where objects and edges are in that image. And what I'm actually going to do, um, and this is a kind of a rendering trick, is using that desk topography, I can actually create a 3D mesh of the terrain. And I can render directly onto it with texture mapping. And that actually allows us to efficiently warp things so they look correct on the, on the desk, no matter where the heights are. Uh, and second, that what I have to do is locate the edges in, that, in the desk topography. That way, we can find suitable spots so that interfaces can actually be attached and snapped onto things. Uh, and so this, you know, we find edges in, this, in the scene. We uh, connect those edges into contours and then filter out bad edges. And finally, then um, uh, split the contours into, into straight line segments. So these will be kind of like rulers where we can attach things. And finally, um, what we actually had to do is implement a a layout engine, something that would allow the interfaces to respond to their environment in an intelligent way. And so this is more complicated than a standard layout engine because it has to deal with the reality that things outside of its own control might influence where interfaces have to live. So what this actually does is it, it defines different costs and penalties. It says, for example, there's a cost if you have an interface that overlaps on top of a world object, on top of an edge. Uh, there's a cost if you have to move interfaces compared to where they were previously, because obviously people want their interfaces to be nice and stable. There's costs for attempting to place applications on top of rough terrain that might be hard to interact with, something that might not be very touch sensitive. And to uh, deal with all of those different um, uh, penalties and costs, 
I implemented a simulated annealing approach that converges the solution to a local optimum. Uh, okay, so how does this look in practice? So unlike WorldKit, you'll see these applications here um, are completely standard touch applications. So they could be web applications, Android apps, whatever. Desktop RPG just gives these a canvas to render to. So what I'm doing here is I'm snapping to the laptop. You see as I move it around, it shows me sort of where things could snap to. Um, uh, you can see, you know, I can reposition, reorient, or resize these as, as much as I want. Uh, you'll notice I use this for resizing because I don't want the two-finger gesture. I want the two-finger gesture to be in the application rather than resizing the, ob uh, the object. And you'll see they actually oh, evade. It's a little bit slow, but it's basically um, what it does is if it detects an uh, instruction, it'll try to move away, but in a way that's, you know, reasonably close by. I can also shrink applications down so, you know, they're mostly out of the way. And finally, you know, I, I have standard pinch to zoom kind of uh, gestures that I can interact with the map. And this is all stuff that, you know, really works. These are applications that you can, you know, run on your desk if you have the suitable hardware. So what's the hardware look like? So for WorldKit, you know, obviously it was this big bulky thing because this was good for prototyping. Uh, for desk topography, what we actually started doing was shrinking things down. A Pico projector, for example, something that's a bit smaller, more svelte, and a uh, smaller depth camera as well. So something that could fit into a lampshade. It's not a lamp yet. It's not like a light bulb. Uh, but it does fit into a lampshade if it's suitable for you know, suitably large lampshades. And uh, this is nice. This is actually a significant evolution of the system size. You know, it's much smaller, um, and it's something that's starting to go towards the vision that we want. But I want it smaller. So I'm going to give, you know, this is actually something that was published at SIGCHI last year. Um, and uh, this is a very, very, very small projector. A very, very small one. <laughs> so um, this is a, a projector that's actually small enough to fit into a smartwatch. So you can see that's the projector module on the right. It's about the size of a US penny or so, a bit bigger. Um, and it's a self-contained smartwatch uh, system. This is a projector that's, that's actually, that we actually built a, a, an Android-powered smartwatch, a fully contained quad-core Android-powered smartwatch uh, that projects a, a touch screen right onto your arm. Now, maybe you're wondering about the battery life. It gets about an hour of, 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 uh, of battery life if you um, run the projection continuously, which is pretty good. Um, considering you know you probably wouldn't have your smartwatch screen on 24/7, um, so that's this is actually showing it in action. And th this is not tethered to anything. This is actually running all on the smartwatch itself, so I can swipe to unlock my smartwatch. Um, and you know, interestingly enough, that that swipe to unlock is not just for privacy's sake. That's actually a calibration gesture. Um, so what I'm actually doing, because if you can actually see when I flex my arm with the Lumi Watch prototype, it changes the angle at which the projection occurs because the, you know, the, the, the skin under the arm is deforming. And because of that, when the system boots up, it doesn't actually necessarily know what angle it's at. And that means that the swipe to unlock is telling the system, okay, this is the correspondence between my skin points and the projection points. And so after that, once you do the little quick little swipe to unlock, it's calibrated. So that's, that serves as a dual purpose. And again, I want to emphasize, this is really self-contained. This is a projector, touch sensing, computation, power supply, all in one. And uh, so with this OEM, well, one of the things that I wanted to do is to actually go forward and try to build a real info bulb, something that has enough brightness and computational power to support those kinds of interactions. And this is something that you know, is coming along gradually. So great. We've covered all of the challenges that I outlined at the start. And of course, this isn't you know, the final story for all of those challenges. There's always more that we could do. But in each case, I significantly advanced the state of the art and pushed new interaction and interaction technologies forward. Uh, but in, in my thesis and, and in sort of my PhD work, uh, it, this wasn't the only thing that I worked on. Right? This, this was one of the things that I worked on um, that kind of lo lay at the intersection between the things that make, I'm really interested in, which is you know, interaction, sensing, and hardware. Uh, but what I actually worked on during my PhD thesis was a bunch of other stuff. Um, and so, yeah, for this talk, I'm going to go through a couple of those other things as well. So, uh, for example, you know, in, in, the, in the areas of AR, VR, touch screens, novel sensing, you know, I had sensing projects. Uh, so this is different approaches to sense uh, human interaction through sensing structured light, radio waves, electromagnetic noise, sound, vibrations, and so forth, and using all those capabilities for interaction. 
So one of the early examples of this is Lumitrack. This is a pair of linear light sensors. Basically, they're 1D sensors, 1D camera sensors, uh, with a projected structured light pattern called a, an M sequence. When somebody shines that M sequence across the sensor, I can figure out where in the sequence it is, and I can use that to track the position of the sensor relative to the projector. And this is useful for things like motion capture uh, systems. Now, the really interesting thing about uh, uh, Lumitrack is you know, it, this is actually a very, very fast and very accurate system. How fast and how accurate? Well, you know, I can, I can do this you know, at a distance, so this is pretty cool. Um, you know, I can do position tracking the projector. Right. I'm actually, and, and key to this is I can actually do this all at about 2,000 frames a second. So this is significantly faster than any sort of existing motion tracking system. Um, Sub-millimeter position tracking, so you can see it's, it's, it's sensitive to even these sort of small jitters in my hand. And, uh, and doing this you know, at almost 2,000 frames a second, doing that all with the signal processing and uh, M sequence decoding everything on that microcontroller board itself. Um, so that's Lumitrack. And there's another novel sensing project, so uh, this time sensing electromagnetic waves. We can take advantage of signals that exist in our environment. So uh, in this project called DSM Machina, what I'm doing is I equip, I equip a smartphone with an antenna. It picks up electromagnetic noise. Uh, many electronic devices will emit characteristic signals and radiation, so this device will actually be able to detect those. And a machine learning classifier then di distinguishes between all of these different household objects. And I can use that to implement sort of on-touch interactions. So what I can actually do, the user taps their phone to an appliance like a printer, and then they can just print to that printer. So you know, when it, you see that little button pops up, that's a contextual charm we call which basically allows you to contextually print to the printer once we know you're nearby and you know, ready to be able to pick up your, your print job. Uh, or for example, you know, when, when you're near enough to a computer, I can send a file to that computer. So this is like upload, upload a file to this, uh, to this thing. And this is different from the printer's icon. The key to this is we, we actually detected the different, uh, the different devices based on their electromagnetic magnetic signature. So in the realm, so you know, switching tacks now, going to touch screens. There's also a really interesting area of research, exploring touch screen interactions that are richer than just tapping and swiping. And as Don Wilk mentioned earlier, this actually formed the basis of a startup. Um, so uh, for example, with that startup, uh, I developed a system called Finger Angle. And what this is doing is it's detecting not just the XY position of your finger, but actually the full finger angle of your, of your finger, right? So the 3D angle. And in this project, that phone has not had any hardware modifications made to it. This is purely software-based. So how does that actually work? Well, what we do is we use the capacitive image. This is actually the raw capacitive data that comes off the sensor. Every phone generates this data and then just throws it away and gives you an XY position. But this data is actually incredibly useful and very, very rich. Um, you can see that when my finger goes down at an angle, that there's a little comet tail that kind of comes out of, uh, out of the finger. We can use that. We can use a machine learning classifier to determine what the finger angle is from that comet tail. Um, and this involved a little bit of Linux kernel hacking. So there was some low-level ca uh, kernel hacking to actually obtain this uh, image essentially before it was thrown away and turned into that XY position. And this can be used for a couple of interactive applications. For example, smartwatches don't have a lot of you know, input opportunities because they're very, very small. So we can use this to implement, you know, for example, uh, pitch yaw gestures, uh, rotation controls, and so forth. Or we can even do this with a phone. We can rotate models in 3D. So this is you know, being able to use that pitch yaw rotation for all three directions in 3D. Or even to play a game. So we can control this little ship flying through space. So these are all the things that I can do with just that extra dimension of touch. And I, I argue this is sort of the real 3D touch, you know, rather than uh, what, what's, being, what's being promoted commercially. Uh, and this is something that's actually currently being commercialized through Kixo as well. So um, interesting technologies that I hope to actually bring out into the real world. Uh, I can also use touch screens to host rich spatial interactions. So this is a different project called CapCam. This is a quick and easy way to synchronize a phone to a display get rich interactions. The user just drops their phone on the display and starts interacting. And the phone and the display synchronize to each other um, because the, the, the display can actually detect the, the, the phone through, again, the capacitive image. Very, very characteristic uh, capacitive image there. Uh, and then what it actually does is it displays a code, a visual code, a visual flashing code to the phone's camera because we can use that capacitive image 
can detect where the camera is. So what that actually looks like is you can see this is the camera image that's coming out of the, the phone. It's showing, it's flashing this, this funny looking code. And that code transmits all the information necessary to set up a bi-directional wireless link. So think Bluetooth pairing code, wi you know, Wi-Fi passkey, you know, encryption um, parameters, all that stuff. And there's enough bandwidth, it's not tons of bandwidth, but there's enough in there to set up that connection so that we don't have to rely on users punching in random numbers into their screen. And we know that you know, the, the, the screen knows that uh, there has to be a phone physically on top of it, so it's only going to display the code to the pixels that are physically on top of it. And the phone will, you know, is only going to see the things that are in the, in the camera view. So this is a, a reasonably secure system that requires physical contact to actually work. Uh, and then it makes, you know, CapCam makes it possible for us to just, you know, easily say, copy some files on and off this device. So I put the phone down, I can copy some files onto it. Uh, or I can copy files off of the device as well. Um, so it's bi-directional. Uh, once that wireless link has been set up as bi-directional, it's, it's a very quick and easy pairing system. And I can even do sell you crazier things like, for example, play air hockey with phones. Um, so what we can do here, you know, uh, it's positionally tracked because, again, the touch screen on the, on the big display is allowing us to track these little uh, phones. And, yeah. Um, now, the nice thing here is that there's, there's actually, you can't hear it here, but there's actually sound and vibration coming out of each individual phone because they're rich controllers, basically. Okay. Um, and finally, I'm just going to show you a couple of projects in augmented and virtual reality, something I'm actually interested in doing. Um, one of my main research interests going forward is, is going to figure out how do we actually improve augmented and virtual reality interactions. So uh, one, of the, one of the things I actually did at, at an, a different project I did at Microsoft Research is building a hardware system that extends the field of view of VR out to 180 degrees, so all the way around you. Uh, but this is actually meant for low resolution displays, so things that aren't gonna distract you, but just sort of provide a little bit of extra contextual context. Originally, this was intended just to provide that extra context, but one of the really interesting findings we had um, through pilot testing was that it actually it had, had the potential of reducing um, motion sickness. Um, this is actually research that's, I think, currently being carried, about, carried out in conjunction with SFU, um, that uh, continued, rather, in conjunction with SFU, that essentially presents what I call countervection. So this is a, vection is the sensation that things are moving in your, in your peripheral visual field. And by presenting the opposite motion in these sort of striped patterns, we're essentially counter, counter, uh, countervailing that particular um, motion sensation. And the idea here is that hopefully, if we counter that enough, we can actually balance out the visual field's uh, effect, and so the visual field will no longer be in, in conflict with the, uh, the, the, the user's um, uh, uh, vestibular system, which is the, you know, the inner ear, right? Because a, a common cause of, uh, of motion sickness is visual vestibular conflict. So this suggests that, and this is of course early studies for now, uh, but this suggests that we can actually reduce motion sickness by displaying just the right things in the peripheral visual field. Okay, um, so just really quick, you know, the, I, I've done more than just that. I, uh, I, I, I've, uh, as, as, uh, as Donald mentioned, I've actually tried to start a startup, uh, a couple different startups actually, Kikso, um, which commercialized finger angle and touch tools, and another startup called Zensors. Um, uh, licensing technologies out into different companies, uh, which have started to actually, you know, try to move these forward into industry, transfer those technologies, and get people to actually start investigating them and using them. Um, doing direct industry collaborations, working with companies on, on projects, and uh, also, you know, uh, working with other researchers on different projects as well. So it's something that, all things that I want to continue doing here at UBC. Um, so yeah, that's my talk. Um, and I hope that I've managed to convince you today that on-world interaction is not only desirable and useful, but it's also something that we could practically achieve. And I've also shown you a little tiny bit of the other stuff that I stuffed into my thesis, kind of. Um, that, you know, things that, uh, that I've worked in the wider space of interaction. Uh, and all this is continuing now at UBC. So, thank you very much. So you talk about on-world instead of in-world, and maybe that's because you're scratching the surface. Uh -huh. <laughs> but the, uh, the original idea was embedding, mm -hmm. and, and um, 
the more serious aspect of this is, don't you think that ultimately you'll need the system to be modeling what's going on in the real world, in the depth, and not just depth, in, in through space over time? Uh, and that that um, <clears throat> may require cooperation of the various devices, including the personal devices, mm -hmm. in which case there's some very interesting security issues about how you do that. Um, but then the uh, sort of real question here is, uh, when you did the thing with picking up the electromagnetic, mm -hmm. and for example, the printer, right. if I walk up to any printer with that same model, Right. And in a similar print room, like over in ISIS, they're all pretty much the same. Right. So you may not know where I am, right. uh, but then the printer is connected to the network. Right. And it could, in fact, activate, because it might not have any sensors on it, but it could activate some function on the printer <laughs> that would generate electromagnetic characteristics. Yep. So have you thought about that, so that you basically are closing the feedback loop? Because that seems to me to be very much the essence of what Weiser was really talking about. So it isn't just uh, passive sensors mm -hmm. in some sense, it's really the active sensing. Right, and, and actually this, this goes back to sort of a, 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 the general problem of, I think the more context we have about the world, the, the more intelligent these systems can be. And I think certainly some of this stuff is kind of an intermediary. I don't, I don't view this as the, the way people are going to interact with computers and computing technology 50 years into the future, right? This is, uh, and, and so, Certainly for the time being, if we could have sensors that have electromagnetic functionality and we could have uh, responses that are generated dynamically, and this is something we actually saw um, uh, during, during testing. You know, we, we, we saw that if we, uh, for example, we had um, the monitors display different content. We, if you had the big enough monitor cycle through a bunch of colors, it would generate characteristic spikes that weren't present normally. So we could, we could co-opt that to generate, you know, so Custom. You quickly yeah. tie that security issue in. You can imagine that if I go to a research lab, mm -hmm. I may want to use their printer. They give me permission to it. I want to use your technique. They do not want me to know anything about that printer, right. even what it's called or anything else, just because there's no reason to. So my phone will need to give up, which it should be willing to do, the electromagnetic data it's getting and let some other part of the system do the processing because the only thing I need to know is which printer. Right. And that's the only thing they want me to know also. That's an interesting um, idea. Because you, you can't download these, I mean, how would I know the characteristic of that printer before, before I arrive? And you shouldn't be giving it to me because that's information I don't have a need to know. Hmm. That's an interesting idea actually. Um, yeah, that's certainly something that could be explored I think. Um, there's a, there's a proposal to do sort of a, a semi-centralized model where if you're connected to a network, then you can perform some sort of network discovery. Um, and that might include network discovering the EM server, right? The server to which you can submit signatures. Yeah, Collins would melt some stuff like that for right. masters at SFU. Right, yeah. there, there, there's, there's some interesting uh, research on that. There's, I think, a lot of software engineering and, networks or, uh, and network design built on top of that as well, which I think crosses over into several fields. So yeah, very interesting. So kind of a blueprint to generate. Yeah, so this is, this is almost asking, like, is there, is there sort of a design blueprint that lets us generate these ideas? And um, there is, well, there, there's kind of a design principle that goes into this, right? There's, there's this, uh, this notion of uh, what signals are given off by a target that I'm interested in? How do we sense those signals? What techniques do we use? So there's a sort of matrix of different uh, approaches to this problem. 
And at this point, since I've explored several of these areas, I can start to generate, OK, um, maybe, you know, does this thing give off acoustic data? Does this thing give off, you know, like infrared data? Does this thing give off, like, uh, electromagnetic data? OK, that's interesting. What sensors can we apply to that problem? What hardware can we apply to that problem? OK, so we know what kind of hardware we could use. What kind of form factor, perhaps, that we, we use to sense them? And then the third one is, OK, how do we actually go about building the software to actually make sense of those signals? So there's, there is, you know, this is obviously uh, something that is a very, very wide design space. And, uh, but it provides kind of a blueprint that a good number of my project could, have, could plausibly fit into. So there'd be something interesting to explore and say, OK, what's the meta, the meta level design technique? There is one. Yeah, there is definitely a design uh, principle behind a lot of this. Another question? Well, I was just going to say that, that part of your answer there, you were talking about, well, what signals are given off, et cetera. And that's a perfectly valid approach. But if you kind of go way back in the history of interaction, there was a, a point that was sort of when the, the graphic standards were getting set. And one of the major breakthroughs, which has its limitations, is the idea of virtual input devices. Mm. And it didn't matter if you used a mouse or a trackpad or whatever, you were getting x, y, or x, y, z, whatever it was, positions. And in some sense, that freed up from exactly you don't care whether it's electrostatic, electromagnetic, uh, capacitive, vision. It's just giving you some measurement. Or, or, and, and that's a different way of looking at things, is sort of the functionality as seen by the application. I think those are compatible, actually. If you look at. Oh, uh, yeah, but, yeah, and, they're, this, and, and they, there's a time for each. Right. Well, I mean, if you actually look, um, but in, in a more specific way, if you look at, for example, MR Touch, I. You know, the, the approach there is, okay, well, we can use depth sensors to sort of figure out where depth, you know, where the fingers are and all that stuff. But what the application sees at the end is compatible with the old input standard yep. XY, yep. right? We, we, at the end, we abstract this all down to XY positions. And for example, for, for, a, for um, the contextual charms, what the application sees is action print. It doesn't see, I used EM to sense these things. It uses the standard app, the Android uh, action actually called action print which just says, OK, you can invoke this, and you will print to this device. So there's no, there is, a, we, we do take advantage of those abstractions. We plug all of our systems into those abstractions so that they're, A, sensible to existing computer systems. And so that's definitely a good point. Yeah, um, I'm not on the, on the point of designing standards, but I will definitely plug into the standards when they exist. Yeah. All right. So um, I want to make a final re remark. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robert is at the Junior Technical team uh, looking for uh, aggressively looking for the networking and collaboration opportunities. So if you feel you want to work with Robert, if you're interested in the topic that we're working on, please come over and try to network with you. I believe you're going to be staying here for a little bit. I'll be here for a bit, yeah. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, all right. That's it for today. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much.